أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطاهرين الطيبين In the previous two sessions what we tried to do was to go over two questions in regards to taqlid first being in regards to why we are supposed to get involved with the concept of taqlid, why we need to follow a mujtahid or a marja. The second question was, if we are supposed to follow a marja, then um, is it correct for us to be following someone that does not live in our circumstances? <coughs> is it correct for us to be following a marja? that does not live and according to some does not understand the circumstances that we live in we gave a few examples now in regards to this question what we tried to explain was what the mujtahid tries to give you is the law he does not apply it for you uh, that was one point and another point was that the laws of Islam are universal the general laws and their, their exceptions altogether it's not like we have two books, we have two sets of laws depending on where you live. We have one set of laws, the mujtahid is supposed to go through the ahadith, through the verses of the Holy Quran, understand what those laws are, and of course he doesn't apply them for you, he just tells you in this situation you're supposed to do this, in the other situation you're supposed to do that. But which situation are you in? Are you in the case where there's harm if you don't, or if you apply a certain law which means that the, app, the exception applies to you or is there not harm well that's up to you is it a situation of necessity or not the marja doesn't tell you if you are in that situation where it's necessary for you to do something which means that that's an exceptional situation and you don't apply the general law you apply the exceptional law we try to explain that the third question that we want to address in this session is related to the previous question, but it gets a little more complicated. <clears throat> we explained that the laws are universal, the laws are the same, and we explained that the marja does not apply them for you, he just explains in different situations what you need to do, but what, what situation are you in? Are you in the situation of um, the exception or the general law, you need to apply that. Which was intended to explain that it doesn't matter where the marja is, what his background is, whether he understands exactly what situation I am in or not, it doesn't matter because he just tells you what the law, what the general law is. He doesn't need to know what circumstances you're in to apply it because he does not apply it for you. He just tells you what the general laws are. What makes it a little more complicated is through technology and through access to the sources, access to the translations of books, people have come across a translation of one of Shahid Mutahari's books, which is a very important book, of course. And what he tries to go over and explain in this book is in regards to the process of ijtihad itself. And this is given an excuse to some to try to question our following and referring to the mujtahideen and the maraja in Qom and in Najaf and elsewhere where it's not in the West. How so? Shahid Mutahari in this book goes over and explains the process of ijtihad and what some things are which influence the understanding and the prospect of a mujtahid. He gives a few examples and he gives a general uh, idea, he puts it forth and he says, for example, that a mujtahid who is born and bred and raised in a village, his fatawa uh, are tinted with the understanding of a villager and a person who's been raised in a city their fatawa or the fatwas and the understandings of a city boy and someone who was raised in the city. 
He gives an ex a particular example and he says, for instance, we have a hadith in regards to tahara, how many times you need to wash yourself in order to become tahir. Now, if a person is living in an area where there's barely any water and you need to be a little more careful how you use that water, you can't be wasteful. You have to try to use the least amount of water necessary to get yourself clean. If such a person refers to the ahadith in regards to tahara, he will have a tendency to understand and to take those who are a little more lenient and which do not include the usage of too much water and they understand it in that way. Whereas if the person who is trying to understand the ahadith and put them into perspective, uh, if they are one who has been living in an area with an abundance of water, then it's very easy for them to say, okay, you know, the hadith says wash yourself three times. So they say, okay, you can do it three times or they give an obligatory precaution very easily. That although uh, it seems like maybe one time would be enough, but as an obligatory precaution, you need to wash yourself three times. This is an example that Shaykh Mutahari uses. And basically the idea is the environment that you're living in is going to uh, have an influence and an impact on your understanding and your ijtihad. So when someone can respond to our previous explanation and say, you said that the laws are universal and uh, that is correct, we accept that. But if you're talking about ijtihad, according to Shahid Mutahari, the mujtahid that is trying to understand what these universal laws are, based on their background, based on their understanding, based on how they were raised, what family, what environment, what region, what climate, it is going to have an impact on the way they understand things. So, in the end, it does make a difference if the mujtahid and the marja lives in our area, is raised with the concerns that we have. So how do we respond to this question? First of all, it's Alhamdulillah, it's a blessing that through um, the spread of the knowledge, scholars speaking and providing people with material to think about, it makes our life more difficult to explain, but it causes people to increase their knowledge. And this is a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What Shaheed Mutahari has mentioned there, he's a great scholar, he is a very well-known mujtahid for those who knew him. He's not only a lecturer, he's not only a thinker that has studied philosophy, no. He is a mujtahid, a student of Imam Khomeini, a student of Ayatollah Buru Jirdi, most definitely one of the top-notch mujtahideen of his time. And so when he says something in regards to ijtihad, he knows what he's speaking of. It's very true. When we look at the fuqaha, depending on where they're from, some of their fatawa, some of their understandings are different. I'll give you an example that I have come across myself. For instance, the mujtahideen who've been living in the Muslim world, they have a question at <clears throat> they have a question at hand, and that question is uh, in regards to rennet, which is a derivative, an, a, a, an animal product. It's derived from the lining of the stomach of calves, goats, uh, of, of sheep. Now, it's clear in the hadith it says that the rennet, or what's used, the Arabic word that is used is infaha. Infaha is tahir, even if it comes from an animal that was not slaughtered Islamically. This is mentioned in the hadith. But then there's a discussion amongst the fuqaha, what is rennet exactly? There are different definitions that are given, at least according to some of the scholars. We find different definitions in the different dic dictionaries that are there. Some suggest that infaha is what is contained within the stomach of an animal like a calf or a goat or a sheep. And other definitions seem to be suggesting that infah is in fact the stomach itself. So now we have this confusion. Is the Imam saying that the stomach is tahir or is he saying that the content of the stomach is tahir if it's 
an animal that has not been slaughtered Islamically. Because obviously, if the animal has been slaughtered Islamically, then it doesn't matter if it's the stomach or the content. Now, the discussions that have gone on in fiqh, the conclusion that uh, a good number of ulama that I have checked, many of them contemporary ulama, they have in the end said, well, what, can, what we can be certain of being tahir is the content of the stomach and the lining of the stomach or the stomach itself, in other words, we cannot be 100% sure, according to them, that this is what is considered tahir. And it's very easy for them to say, okay, you know what, this, uh, we're going to stick to what we're certain of and there's not really any need to uh, investigate further and to try to prove that the stomach itself is tahir if it's not an animal that's been slaughtered Islamically. Well, in the Middle East, um, in the Muslim world, that's pretty easy because the animals that are slaughtered over there are slaughtered Islamically. And therefore, it doesn't really matter what conclusion they reach in this, on this particular issue. However, when you come to the West, it doesn't matter how they've defined infaha, the word rennet is a product that is derived from the lining of the stomach. They use that, and if we don't consider the lining of the stomach to be tahir, then the cheeses that use animal rennet, because some of them don't, and according to some, a lot of them don't, well, those which use the animal rennet, they're not going to be considered tahir for us. So for us, it does make a big difference, especially until recent times where the only rennet was animal rennet, because more recently, I don't know when this started being developed, but they have rennet that they produce from uh, bacterial sources, from fungi, and therefore that's not going to be najis anyhow, because it's not from animal source. But the ones that are from animals, and back in the old days, all of the cheeses, they use the lining of the stomach. So for us living out here, it makes a huge difference so it requires uh, further research. All right. So we do have these examples that because something being less relevant, there's less research doing done on it, and other things where they're more relevant, you do more research on them, and where it doesn't really make too much of a practical difference. It's easy to say when something is not too much of a practical concern that you need to take an obligatory precaution because there aren't many people that are faced with that situation. But if there's many people that are faced with that situation, then you can't easily say this is an obligatory precaution. You need to get, investigate further and make it a little easier for the believers to practice if we have any uh, lenience that we can find in the sources. Obviously, we can't make it up and that needs to be made clear. So although this is clear, then what is our response and are we agreeing? Is it correct then to conclude, since this is true, then we need to start following people out here in the West. We need to start looking up the fatawas ourselves. We need to start looking up and looking through the ahadith ourselves. What we need to understand is, although this is true, what this results to, what Shaheed Mutahari is trying to say, and the practical implication of this, is in two areas. One, for those who are pursuing ijtihad, for those who are trying to uh, become mujtahids, for those who are trying to derive the practical laws, it's important for them to understand that they need to make sure they need to remove anything from their mind that is going to be tenting their view in any way. They need to make sure they're completely open-minded and they're not understanding something because of the background they're coming from. That's something that's very important in sessions where the mujtahideen, the teachers, the scholars try to train their students. They spend a lot of time trying to clear that up for their students. But the people that we're talking about out here that are raising this question and saying we shouldn't be following the mujtahids over there, they're not in the process of ijtihad themselves. They're not learning to become mujtahideen themselves. So from this perspective, it doesn't really have a practical implication. It just means that if anybody decides to go to the Hawza and pursue ijtihad, then they need to be careful of this idea. 
The other practical implication that it has is that if you have a number of mujtahideen that are all of them qualified and they are very uh, strong in ijtihad, they're experts in the field, if you have a number of them, you have two or three or four of them, then one of them is from a similar background that you're from, they have been born and raised in an area that you are from, they understand your circumstances, they understand your questions, they understand your concerns, and then you have some that are not from that background, then if you have an option, then you should try to go with the one that has been raised in your environment, understands your concerns, because more than likely, they are going to be more involved with trying to derive those tougher questions for you. They will be explaining and understanding the fatawa from your perspective more than those who are not. All right, this is a practical result of this discussion. However, what is not a practical conclusion is that we need to go and start doing ijtihad ourselves in the sense that we start picking up hadith books ourselves right now or we need to start referring to scholars that are not mujtahideen or are not as qualified as the mujtahideen over there in the East and start following these people. This is not a practical conclusion and implication. This is not what Shahid Mutahari is trying to get to. Why? Because this does not conclude that we can go to people that are not experts in the field. Look, we have a responsibility. Remember the first question that we asked, and that's why it's such a fundamental issue, and that's why we spent so much time trying to ex explain it. We are responsible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to or in regards to our practical laws. We need to put his teachings in practice. So on the day of judgment, we need to have an excuse if we did anything wrong. If they ask us why we did this or the other, we need to have a logical and a sound argument, a hujjah, a proof between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say this is why I did it. And that would be an excuse such that I would not be punished because of doing something that was actually not correct. Now, the hujjah between us and Allah is a qualified mujtahid. There are differences amongst maraja, and we know for a fact that it can't be such that two contradicting views are both going to be correct. That's not possible. It's either one is correct or the other. But what makes it easy for us is that it doesn't matter which one is in reality the correct answer because we don't have access to that. The only thing we have access to is our hujjah, our proof. We need to refer to a qualified marja. And if we do have, if we did have qualified maraja living in the West, then yes, of course, obviously we would have to choose them over those who are not around us and those who are living elsewhere because they would have more of an understanding of our situation. But that doesn't mean we can go to unqualified scholars, people who have not reached the state of ijtihad, they cannot derive practical laws in a legitimate way and start to follow them. We can't do that. We can't start doing our own incomplete ijtihad. That's not a conclusion. So, in the end, the last conclusion that we want to get from this uh, discussion is that, all right, if you guys think that we want people that can understand our circumstances better, that's a great idea. We need to start to get to work ourselves. We need to have more students going from the West to study Islam thoroughly, become mujtahids, become qualified maraja, and then the people of the West start following them. And None of the maraja, none of the mujtahideen would have any issue with that. That would be something that is preferable according to all of the mujtahideen. But not that we start doing our own research without having the qualifications. It doesn't mean that we're allowed to start following people who've studied a little bit in the Hausa or a number of years in the Hausa 
Maybe even they've reached ijtihad, but their level of ijtihad is nowhere near the scholars that are currently the maraja. It does not give us the justification to start following these people. I hope and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, clarified this issue through the explanations that were given. I hope this was uh, clear enough and if it wasn't, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make up for the shortcomings and do make it clear for the brothers and sisters that are listening insha'Allah.